The banking world is changing faster than ever before and it will never change this slowly again. It's amazing how different the, the financial institutions are globally. The, right now, the concern I have is that in most countries, the regulatory and the compliance areas are not keeping up with changes. You know, it's interesting. When you ask me about the metaverse and investing metaverse, I believe cash. Will it benefit from AI? Yes. Are there new risks that we haven't even thought of? Yes. Today, we have the privilege of hosting Jim Marus, a keynote speaker, co-publisher of the financial brand, owner of the Digital Banking Report, and host of Banking Transform podcast. Jim's expertise has been featured by major media outlets such as CNBC, BBC, CNN, and he has advised the White House on banking policy. Jim, thank you for joining us today. It's great to be on with you. Did I miss anything introducing you? No, that's perfect. I like the short one. That's good. A couple months ago, we saw each other in Amsterdam at Whistlebank Forum, and the world has slightly changed since that time, hasn't it? Yeah, it, you know, it's, it's interesting. You know, we went from COVID to the economic crisis to then having to deal with the changes because of Silicon Valley Bank and other institutions. So, you know, as I say often, is that the the banking world is changing faster than ever before and it will never change this slowly again. Let me remind you, my name is Dennis Ostapchenia. I'm head of financial technologies at Anderson IT Company. Our research and development department works on the content for this channel and also collects the best practices of fintech software development. You can view the examples of such case studies on our website. The link is in the video description. If you need to go digital, cut operational costs or automate your business processes, we will offer the best possible solution for a business case. Contact us. I have plenty of topics to discuss today, so let's jump to the questions. Throughout history, banks have often changed their form and function. Uh, initially, they were simple money lenders and money changes from the Italian World Banco table. So do you anticipate a new round of evolution of financial systems where new microfinance services could significantly displace traditional banks, causing them to lose their monopoly on the provision of most financial services again? Well, it's interesting because what I'll say legacy or traditional financial institutions are already experiencing what I, I call a silent attrition. It's not that people are leaving their primary financial institution, but what they're doing is they're multiplying the number of players that they interact with. So while I may not close an account that I've had for years, I am opening other accounts for the organizations that serve specific needs. So what we're seeing is not really the elimination of players, but the duplication of players where with regard to what I want to have to serve me. So for instance, I have a primary personal financial relationship. I have a primary business relationship. But as I said before, PayPal is my real business bank and Acorns and Robin, Robinhood and SoFi are my personal financial institutions that I interact with the most. In addition, like my son, I think if you were asking him who's his primary financial institution, it may be Venmo. So it may actually be a payment account as opposed to what we would usually see as a checking account or a current account. And we understand that the financial system in the United States significantly differs from the European and Asian systems. So what factors make it more vulnerable on one hand and more advanced on the other? Yeah, it's interesting as I travel the world and speak, it's amazing how different the, the financial institutions are globally. I mean, in Africa and South America, you're really seeing payments players being the most important because a lot of the people in those countries do not necessarily trust their traditional financial institution. In Europe, there's a lot more of a privacy regulation issue that, that organizations are really focusing on, while that's less of an issue in the United States. In the United States, I believe we lag other countries with regard to our payments um, systems. They're, they're not nearly as up-to-date and as progressive as other places in the world. Our digital banking capabilities are not like they are in China, but probably more like they are in the UK. But really what's the biggest difference is the number of financial institutions we have. We have thousands upon thousands of institutions, small, big, top five, bottom 20. We have credit unions, we have traditional banks. 
So there's so much interaction that in some cases you can say, okay, that keeps the competition high, but overall the expectations of consumers, especially in the United States, I think is lowered to the point where they say, you know, yeah, I don't expect very much from my traditional financial institution, so I put up with more. But we're seeing that change as fintechs start to compete and as other organizations compete, especially the payments players and the tech companies, as they're providing more financial services that really meet the personalization and specialized needs. So I think on two sides, I think to your point, it's more competition, so there's not there's less risk to a degree. But there's also more risk because we're not as progressive in the United States as there is overseas. I mean, I went to um, Shenzhen, China in 2020, beginning of 2020, and just saw WeBank. And to see WeBank work with the cloud, work with personalization, work with the democratization of banking so that every single consumer in that country could have a relationship and where they can make changes to their platform, to their products, to their services, in a matter of days as opposed to months or years, as in the United States. It's amazing how they differ, but some of it also has to do with the consumer, where the consumer expectations are different in both in all these different countries as well. Um, and you just mentioned that there are myriads of different types of banks, depending on their size and, and their role in the United States. And you also claim that a successful future opens up today rather to the largest banks or the smallest. Uh, could you clarify your thoughts? Uh, what is wrong with the others? You know, it's interesting. Everybody aspires to be like the big banks, the top five, top 10, whatever you want to look at. But the reality is the consumer is not looking for that. And a lot of it is invisible. It's the back office technology. When I talk about the fact that the smallest and the largest are making the most innovations, making the most progress, I think it's because the big banks have a lot of money. On the other hand, the smaller banks have a lot of agility, ability to pivot on a dime, and also they have leadership that really embraces change much more than what I'll call the mid banks. And in the mid banks, I'm looking at 50 billion to 250 billion, where when you have legacy leadership, and legacy leadership has been in place for in some cases 20, maybe 30 years, and those financial institutions have always been successful, they've always made money, that desire to change when you realize you're not going to be a big bank is a little less urgent. When you look into the smaller financial institutions, you find a lot of leaders that are doing exciting things. You know, one of the interviews I did for my Banking Transform podcast was with Coastal Community Bank in Everett, Washington. Coastal Community has, I believe it's five or six billion dollars in assets, but they have a banking as a service platform where they made a relationship with a company called One. One was a distributor of financial services, a kind of a bank, but Coastal Community was the bank behind the bank. They were actually providing the services. Well, what's interesting in that case is One was purchased by Walmart to be the platform upon which the Walmart digital bank will be built. So all of a sudden you're looking at a small, relatively small financial institution in Everett, Washington, who has extraordinarily progressive leadership that made a relationship that could turn their bank into a behemoth from the standpoint of size, from at least a relationship and connection standpoint to 300 million consumers that are served by Walmart. And what steps would you recommend to a bank to become more attractive to its customers? And could you please rate these steps top down? Yeah, I, I, when organizations say, where should we start with regard to being a company, a digital bank, or with regard to innovation, I believe that the first place they need to start is on the acquisition side, both from the lending and deposit side. If a financial institution makes it difficult for a customer to open an account and they don't allow a true digital account opening process, then they've cut people off at the front door. And what we've seen in our research for the digital bank report is that organizations usually, when they say they have a digital new account opening process or a digital loan application process, if I was to do it on my phone, it would take between 15 and 20 minutes. That's unacceptable. I mean, nobody wants to stay on their phone for 15 or 20 minutes. And what happens is the abandonment rate for the processes are somewhere between 60 and 70%. So 
they lose 60 to 70 percent of potential customers right off the start because of the cumbersomeness, the, the lack of seamless integration with the overall banking process. Now, some of those customers may abandon and go to a branch, but most of them are going to look for an alternative provider. So if you were to ask me, what is the first place an organization should start? It's to truly digitize the new account opening and new lending pro uh, application process, which means changing the back office. There's a number of great providers out in the marketplace that can help a financial institution streamline their account opening process to get down to three to five minutes, which is exactly what you want for a consumer that's used to opening a credit card with Apple, used to signing on to Hulu or Netflix, or used to buying something through Amazon in a really quick, seamless way. If you can get it down to three to five minutes, you're going to retain those customers. So you could automatically double the number of new customers you have on the deposit or the lending side. The problem is, and the overarching problem is, organizations make a partnership with a solution provider that provides that solution, and then they get in the way. When they build the relationship, they say, well, I like everything you're going to offer, but I don't want to have a digital know your, know your customer platform. I want to use a driver's license or a government ID. When you start with that, you've already broken the process and made it so you'll never get down to three to five minutes. So what we find, and this is a case between the small and big banks as well, is bankers can't get out of their own way many times. We can't change the back office fast enough to keep up with what we need to do on the front office customer experience. So that what I call the top of screen experience is not correlated with the behind the scenes or the below the screen back office processes. So unless you digitize the back office, the front office is never going to be in place. Now, what else? Consumers want easier ways to pay. They want more of an embedded financial relationship where it can be everywhere I want to be and the bank almost becomes invisible. They want an open banking platform, not from the standpoint of a super app, but they want easy integration between their basic services and services offered elsewhere. We still find a number of financial institutions that if I wanted to integrate Robinhood, if I want to integrate Acorns, my primary financial institution makes it very difficult to connect accounts. That's broken. So I'm actually going through the, the list priority-wise where I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time right now, except for the biggest banks, are things such as, let's talk about digital banking from the standpoint of a uh, 3D or a, uh, an, an immersive experience where you have a, a, a bank that looks like it's a, a, a game plan, you know, a, a gaming system. The reality is I don't have to worry about the metaverse if I'm a midsize or a small financial institution with regard to the experience being digital or almost like a VR screen. Now, I do have to worry about metaverse when it comes to things like chat GPT. So it's one of those priorities. What an organization needs to do today, they need to prioritize what their why is first. So what is their why? What are they going to be as a financial institution? And then build a priority schedule based on their why. And they need to do it as fast and as easy as possible. So in most cases, even with the biggest banks, they're going to need to partner with financial fintech companies or third-party providers that can provide the solutions and will continually enhance those solutions based on the technology available in the marketplace. But again, what you need to look at is what can I do quickly? What can I do which is also scalable? We're no longer looking at an iterative process of annual plans of innovations. No, most companies have got to look at two months, one month, maybe three weeks to be able to implement an innovation across their entire customer base. But that again means leadership's got to get out of the way when it comes to updating and innovating the financial services process. Most of the companies I meet wanted to be implemented yesterday. Yeah, exactly. You know, and you know, the challenge is you don't know what's coming next. I mentioned ChatGPT. You know, ChatGPT was introduced November 30th of last year.
It got updated March 23rd. That's not a very long process. And it wasn't a small update. It then got updated like three Fridays ago. So maybe a month and a half later. These iterations, these changes are coming so fast that the technology is almost going faster than people can keep up with. And that's going to happen across the entire banking industry. Because again, I shouldn't be comparing my bank to the bank across the street or the bank across the country. I've got to compare my bank to Netflix, to Amazon, to Apple, what those companies are doing from the standpoint of financial services and innovation. Because ever since COVID, the consumer's aware of what's possible. They no longer accept a generalization, a personalization. They realize if my TV can adjust my viewing based on my previous viewing habits, if Amazon can limit what they offer me based on my previous purchase behavior, why can't my finance institution specialize a service, a checking account, a savings account, maybe a lending relationship, specifically to what I want instantaneously? Uh, Jim, let's move to the UK for a while. The governor of the Bank of England, Andrew Bailey, stated in the recent interview that, I quote, the growth of the non-bank financial sector, including institutions such as hedge funds and pension funds, meant there were now fresh risks to stability that needed to be monitored. So do you agree that the combination of high inflation and high interest rates in a global context leads to the fact that the vulnerability of the global financial system can be found where there is no strict financial regulation, from the cryptocurrency market to traditional exchange speculation? And do we expect another wave of regulation in the financial sector in the near future? It's not going to be a wave. It's going to be a continuous surge, uh, more of a rising of the tide. The, right now, the concern I have is that in most countries, the regulatory and the compliance areas are not keeping up with changes. I mean, we just recently had some discussion in our Congress about what ChatGPT could change the world. We're having discussions about what tech firms are doing in the financial services space. We have discussion across the country and in almost every country about how should fintech firms be regulated. We have to stay up with regulation because the purpose of regulation and compliance is the safety of the consumer. The consumer can't be responsible for keeping up with what organizations are safe, which ones aren't. When we see fast changes in interest rates, when we see fast changes in market behavior based on, let's say, social media, we need regulatory regulations that are going to be in place that will help not slow down in innovation, but improve innovation. Innovation does not have to be counter to regulations but regulations have to keep up. And I, I, I kid about it in the United States, our regulators, many of them, have no idea what crypto is, have no idea what the impact can be, have no idea what ChatGPT could impact the financial service industry. So what we have are, we have regulators that they are, by nature, the oldest bankers, the bankers who have been in the industry the, the, mo the longest period of time. We have some innovative regulators over there. I have a, a good uh, relationship with the regulator out of New York State. She's very progressive. She knows a lot about what's going on in the crypto world and in other areas. But the reality is it's not uniform. And it's not uniform in every country. Now, if you're talking about, let's say, Africa or South America, where most of the innovation be done in the payment space, that's not as hard as it is in, in the UK, where there's people that are extraordinarily concerned about privacy, authentic authentication, identity, these things that keep on coming up. And the challenge is we need to be ahead of the curve rather than behind the curve. And getting back to the US, so SVB depositors attempted to withdraw $42 billion from their accounts within one day, similar to what happened with Credit Suisse. Uh, the client's reaction to the crisis was immediate in large part because mobile banking and virtual credit cards allow everyone to react almost instantly to any panic-inducing rumors managing their own finances in real time. Uh, doesn't this make the global banking system extremely vulnerable in the face of any crisis, where human factors, sim simply psychology, rather than financial analytics or forecasts, start to play a crucial role? 
And in your opinion, shouldn't that behavior be made more responsible, for example, by imposing substantial penalties for emergency withdrawals of transfers of funds or by introducing moratoriums on the use of accounts at the regulator's request in uncertain situations? Wow, you packed in a lot in that question. Number one, with regard to what happened with Silicon Valley Bank and with Credit Suisse, it's just amazing what we weren't aware of how much the industry changed over the last 15 years when all of a sudden somebody can get on Twitter, have the multitude of people that are depositors to one financial institution withdraw their funds to the point where the U.S. government for the first time ever shut down a financial institution midday on Friday instead of waiting for the weekend, which was always the case in history. The challenge is the movement of money can be instantaneous. The matching of funds, the deposits against investments has to be really equalized. We also have to make sure that we have a lot of flexibility. I think every financial institution has become aware of what risks are at hand, but more importantly, they become more aware of how much they have to stay in touch with their customers. A customer is not going to necessarily withdraw their funds if they trust their financial institution. This was a financial institution crisis, not a banking industry crisis. It was a wake-up call. But I think we have to be really careful about saying this puts the entire financial services industry at risk when really it puts certain institutions that maybe didn't manage their portfolio the way they should have, didn't manage their balance sheet the way they should have, and weren't really aware from the re regulator standpoint what could happen. Well, we kind of know what that is right now. And I think a lot of financial institutions are resetting what their parameters are and what they need to have for a safety measure. But I think more than ever, financial institutions realize they need to stay in touch with their customers. They need to stay in touch with the people that will make that decision. For instance, if I got a notification on Twitter about a financial institution that I really believed in, that I was really comfortable with, I rely on my government and my financial institution to do what's right because they have in the past. However, you know, the risk has got to be borne by both sides. The risk has got to be borne by the regulation side. It's got to be borne by the, the financial institution. And part of the, the responsibility is also on the consumer. You know, we had a mortgage crisis back in 2007, 2008, that they're still pointing fingers as to who is to blame. But the tea leaves were easy to read. As you look back, everybody said this was not that hard to see. We need regulators, we need government officials, and we need bankers to be aware of what can happen, because eventually it will. There are gaps in today's world, and there's a situation now where the, the, the timeline between impact or cause and effect is shortened to seconds. I mean, we didn't have Twitter back in 2007, 2008, or it's the very beginning of that. That was not the primary way to communicate. But we see this across the globe. We also have to worry about the, the clarity and the honesty of the media we're seeing. You know, could a rogue player put fear in people's minds that isn't real, that has to be checked? We've got to look at these things. So is there more risk? Yes, there definitely is. Is the financial system at risk? I don't think so, because consumers are always going to look for, where's my safest place to put funds? In most cases, it's going to be a financial institution. I'm not a big believer of, of metals and crypto and things like this being a good, good counterbalance to that. But I think, again, the regulations have to be put in place not to stifle innovation. This should, regulation should not be put in place to make it so it's tough for, fin, for fintech firms or for lenders or for deposit firms to do business. There's a democracy here that you really have to look at capitalism and how that all balances out. But there's got to be an awareness level. We caught ourselves, we got caught being unaware of what could happen. And we saw the instantaneous reaction to that when in 2000, 2008, that type of period, any run of the banks would have been lying outside the bank as opposed to simply people pushing a button on their computer. And continuing the topic, the latest April Global Financial Stability Report from the IMF, International Monetary Fund, states that modern technologies pose a threat to global financial stability, particularly 
nothing that, and here is quote, amplified by new technologies and the rapid spread of information through social media, what initially appeared to be isolated events in the US banking sector, have quickly spread to banks and financial markets across the world, causing a sharp repricing of interest rate expectations and a dramatic sell-off of risk assets. Do you share this forecast, or does the situation appear less dramatic in reality? Is the blame truly on new technologies, or is it actually about us? It's interesting, because I don't think there's a blame here. I think there's a potential risk we have to be aware of. I think awareness in every avenue it has been lessened, and people are unaware. We have, a, as I get, got back to earlier, we have a lot of legacy leadership that's not even normalized to digital banking. You know, I, I bet I could go into some of these boardrooms and find people that don't believe in digital banking, that they provide it. You, we've got to reset our boards. We have to reset our leadership. You know, we, we have, I, I, I talk about it, and now I'm going to go airways with it, but, the, you know, a lot of financial institutions are filled with boards and, and leadership teams that are th- been in banking 30 years, and the, the white men that played golf together back in management training, they've gone through the, the roles. They have not had a bad year, so there was no reason to disrupt it. But we have to bring more diversity of thought, diversity of gender, diversity of race. We have to really look on a broader sense what banking is, because simply not performing as well as others is no longer an option. You really have to be striving for those innovations in technology, in thinking, in culture that really is going to look and say, we'll protect ourselves from what the IMF said. And, and IMF, I think, very much like there's people out there today talking about um, AR and AI and, and all these things. What could happen? I think we have to be aware of those things. But I'd hate to say we have to shut down things. You know, I don't believe in shutting down technologies or innovations to make them right. I believe in speeding up the process of making them right as opposed to changing the process overall. In a digital environment where we deal with a race of heterogeneous data supplied by various devices and services that are intertwined with our lives, development companies strive to achieve the ideal seamless data integration so that all data arrays finally function as a unified whole. In your opinion, Achieving these goals should make our lives much more comfortable and easier when consuming information uh, and services. Or will it ultimately destroy our privacy and the ruthless transparency of our digital footprint? Because uh, it seems that this will force us to seek anonymity again and hide our digital races as much as possible through specialized services. After all, I may not want the system to know my entire financial history, for example. You know, that's interesting. At the root of that is the consumer should be the owner of their identity. With regard to in a corporate world or a global situation, who do I want probably to have the authentication keys is still the consumer. But the financial services industry should play a major role here because we have some of the most valuable data to the overall global world, you know, global business world. So we need to take a responsibility in the financial services industry to improve our privacy, our authentication, and our overall regulatory environment. I keep on coming back to regulations, but we're not going to do it unless we're forced to. But really when it comes down to it, I look at Amazon. I look at how much information they have on me. They know my credit card accounts. They know my business accounts. They know what I buy. Because at the end of the day, It's what I do daily that they understand, certainly more than my bank does. However, why do I allow that? Why do I actually pay them to have all this data? The reality is it's because I trust them. They have not had a major infiltration. They've not had a major crisis. And what it comes down to is privacy and trust become a balancing act. And if you give me reasons to really value what you're doing with my information, I'll give you more of it. I mean, are we going to shut down the banks? Or am I going to stop driving my car that I realize now more than ever knows where I am, knows what's going on in my automobile, knows where I go, how much time I spend there. I mean, there's data everywhere. So you can't shut down data. What we do look at 
if for years, and I just had an interview on the Bank of Grand Forum podcast with David Birch, and he said what's interesting, he's always been an advocate of identity. You know, let's get a universal identity. He now says, you know what's more important because all that's happened in the identity space is authentication. Can you authenticate that this is my identity as opposed to simply my identity? Because right now we're seeing that identities can be replicated. It can be copied, facial recognition. But you put in a double authentication process that not only authenticates via my phone or my wearable device, maybe it's a ring, maybe it's a bracelet, but more importantly, make it so these things continually alter so that nobody can have my identity in a moment. He was mentioning in his story that he was sitting down at a cafe in, in London and his phone got stolen off the table. He was within seconds able to shut down the entire authentication curve of what who he was and what they could access. So the phone became basically a, a worthless device. At the end of the day though, how do we educate the consumers to be able to do it smart? I mean, we still have, myself included, people that use too many IDs that are similar across platforms. Why is that? Because it's difficult to, to find the way to keep it so that all your, your ID codes, all your security codes differ and you can keep track of them and keep on changing them. Let's get the education factor up there as well. Uh, let's move to AI questions. Uh, Jim, do you think that robo-bankers can become more successful than humans in managing large financial institutions? And can the banking sector be fully automated? Uh, can a neural network become the most successful trader in the securities market? Um, I'm, I'm not one that does well or even tries to do well in the predicting the future game. I'm more of a pragmatist to talk about what organizations need to do today. But I think one thing that's clear is one without the other, the humanized versus the digital, can't work independently. You know, we've seen a complete switch where in the past the digital actually supplemented the branch world. Now it's really the branch becomes a supplement to the digital world. That's going to continue to happen. I think we're going to see humans not being replaced but their jobs are going to be redefined. Will there be some loss of jobs? Yes. I'm not going to be the one to say, number one, you're not going to close branches. You're not going to have people that lose their jobs. But at the end of the day, it's about how willing are the humans going to be to become part of the future. I said at the beginning of our, our discussion that change has never happened this fast. It'll never happen this slowly again. Are you willing to, as a human or as an organization, are you willing to disrupt What was your past? Are you really disrupt what your future is going to be? What your role in that's going to be? You know, financial institutions, just like humans got to define, where is my future going to be in the scope of everything that's offered? I think right now we have a lot of back office processes that are extraordinarily antiquated. They may be digital, but behind the scenes they're still doing things in an analog way. They're still doing things in the step-by-step -step process they did back when there's paper involved. Well, the reality is that's got to change. Will some jobs be changed? Yes. But I think we have to, as financial institutions, as regulators, as governments, have to really see what is the role of the human in a world that has a lot more digital capabilities. You know, I, I, I know from a perspective of being a writer and being a content producer, I'm using some AI functionality today to make my articles, to make my podcast, to make my interviews, to make my mind more futurized. I'm not young. I'm not a 20-year-old looking to say, how do I protect my future? The reality is I could probably back off now and I'll be okay. But the reality is I don't want to. I want to say, how can I move forward with the times? How can I continually change? So will AI, will, will the neural network completely eliminate the financial services industry? No. I think there's always going to be humans involved to some degree. The degrees may change, but I think we're going to find more and more ways the financial services industry can integrate within my life. And as that happens, you're going to need specialists that really understand every element of what I want in banking. And some of that's going to take humans where there aren't humans today. In other words, you are not afraid of being left without a job soon because of technologies like ChatGPT. Oh, I, I, I definitely think that um, 
there's a possibility, and I've tested it, or ChatGPT, for instance, I ask it to write like me, given the fact that I give it examples of my writing, and it gets fairly close. But the problem is the depth of information, the depth of experience is not shown in that writing. So you miss some human elements. But again, that takes me thinking beyond what is currently today and saying, how do I bring my experiences more into the, the mix of what I'm doing that makes me individually more important from the standpoint of individuality and in what I create, but also leverage the tools that are out there to make it so I'm also more efficient. Several well-known experts and businessmen in the field of AI development and technological innovations uh, recently came forward with an initiative to impose a veto on any further training from neural networks and use the potential danger of uncontrolled AI progress for humanity. So do you share these concerns or do you believe that humanity will benefit more from the development of AI, uh, especially in the field of finance? You know, it's interesting. Will it benefit from AI? Yes, definitely going to benefit from AI. Are there new risks that we haven't even thought of? Yes. And, and I, I, I hate to keep on getting back to regulation because I'm not a big regulatory guy. I'm a small government type person. But the reality is we have to think outside the box. You know, Sam Altman just uh, was in Congress talking about the risks involved. And he said, we need to see what can be done because with, as with every financial transaction, for as much good that can come to the marketplace, there's people out there that are saying, I want to disrupt this. I want to, I want to get the benefit here before anybody can catch me. There needs to be protections put in place. There needs to be security of your identity and of authentication. But reality is, I think, while this can be scary at times, the potential of AI is just so enormous. And yes, things are going to be disrupted. But I look at the fact that my wife and I just traveled uh, basically the entire United States from where we stay in the wintertime to where we are right now. And during the journey, we wanted to find out what's the weather going to be along the way. We wanted to find out what hotels are along the, the path that we want to take that allow dogs and that have an opening and that were in our price range. And the reality is right now, there's no idea of how I could get it right now, but I want to be able to do it on my, my phone and ask my phone this and get it known because you can connect all those points. That's AI. It's artificial intelligence and it's bringing together data points. That helps me. That helps me as a human. That makes my life easier. My wife right now is planting all around our front yard to know what plants are going to survive the best in this weather, what she should do to, to make it so they're easier to maintain. All these things are all what intelligence can bring. Farmers, we already are seeing examples of where farmers take the high-end technology, which most people don't realize how much technology is in their tractors and in their weather forecasting. But we got to bring all these things together. That makes it so we can become more efficient. We can feed each other. We can make it so the lowest level of financial sustenance can be met easier. This is all going to help quite a bit. And I'm, a, I'm an optimist by, by nature. I'm also a pragmatist to say, there will be bad characters out there on an ongoing basis whenever there's a, a way to make money. We just have to make it so that we put more protections in place and we take more responsibility to not just get the benefits and then ignore the, the risks. Uh, Jim, and thinking about negative scenarios, is it possible that in the future people may fall into that slavery to AI? There'll be some jobs. I mean, I, I think when you look at things like, I'm going to say accounting on a general basis, bookkeeping, you know, there's been changes in every industry. You look at the auto industry. I'm sorry, I grew up during an auto industry that was filled with people in warehouses. You can now make cars in a much smaller place without one human. I saw phones being manufactured in Shenzhen, China, and there were maybe seven humans on the floor, and they were simply there to try to see how they can make it so there were less, can be less humans on the floor. That didn't make the world worse. It made it worse for the people involved, but the reality is there are options out there for people. There are needs going to be an understanding that we've got to accept change. Change sucks. I mean, I, I use the example that when you go to the doctor, the doctor is going to tell you what you need to do to become healthier. You may do it for a month, but there's no risk. So you say, ah, okay, I'm going to go back to my old habits. Yeah. Until the doctor says, 
by the way, you're going to die. It's amazing how we can accept change when there's a high risk factor. The reality is we just have to look around ourselves and, and become aware that change is going to be part of every part of our lives from beginning to end going forward. We need to embrace that. We need to take risks where in banking, you have to remember when I got hired as a banker, I got hired because I was accepting the fact that there wouldn't be a whole lot of change. I was going to be protecting the bank from risk as opposed to taking risk. And that overall, I, the reward factor was not the biggest thing I went for. The reality now is people have to understand that you need to accept change. You need to take risks. You have to modify those risks. But that's where the real payoff becomes. We've seen people have massive payoffs because they were first to the market to accept change. We saw a lot of that during COVID at a time when the world was shut down. Seen people completely reinvented themselves because it was able to be done then. We have to realize that's part of the world today. My wife went from traditional retail, store-based retail, to digital retail. My son went from one sport to another sport, and now is in the business world. That takes continuous mindset change, where it used to be there were, there were many people that, when I grew up, there's people that have been in their careers for 30 and 40 years. That's not going to happen very much anymore unless a person is willing to continually evolve within their position. And really the major takeaway in our discussion has to be that at the end of the day, leadership has to lead. They can't just accept success as being good enough. They have to have a challenger mindset. They really have to look at the world differently and say, how can we stay ahead of what's happening in the marketplace? Because eventually the, the knock on the door is going to come and they go, You've just been taken over. You're not running as efficiently as somebody else thinks you can be, and they want to bring their team in. To date, only a few countries have dared to experiment with CBDC. In Nigeria, this led to mass protests by the country's residents. And in China, the use of digital yuan is limited to only six cities. And some civil activists refer to this trend as the beginning of crypto-fascism and predict even greater infringement of, of civil and financial freedoms. While financial regulators themselves, it seems, are not psychologically ready for a large-scale game in this area. Do you agree that this is a matter of human psychology and resistance to everything new, and that adaptation will occur within a short time, as happened, for example, with physical cards and some other technologies? That's a great question. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen as far as the timeline for governmental run digital currency, it's going to happen in my lifetime. And I have a shorter span than some. On the other hand, as you mentioned, the desire for people to use cash, which amazes me today, the desire to use credit cards and plastics, which again amazes me because it's so less secure than a digital payments process. It's going to be an evolutionary process. And when you're talking about payments, which is really what we're talking about and the transfer of money, there are multiple parties involved in the payments process. You not only have the consumer, but you have the merchant, you have the bank, you have the government all involved. They all have to get on the same page to say the benefits outweigh the costs. Well, we found out during COVID that restaurants the, the, and small retailers, which were really all cash-based or card-based, they immediately transferred to be much more digital-based. You know, was, I was in Rome I think it was 2018. I don't think I took my wallet out one time, never used cash, was able to make all my payments with my phone. I now am able to leave my wallet at home and I pick the place of where I'm going to transact based on the ability to use digital transactions. But it's still using the phone as the device. I'm going to Money 2020 in a week and I already know that one of the things I'm going to be doing when I'm over there is I'm going to be getting a wearable. I'm going to be getting a ring or a bracelet that's going to be able to make the payments Part of that is just my own inquisitive mind saying, oh, is this better than a phone? But also because I want to have more control over how I'm connecting things. And by having a new device allows me to only connect what I have connected. Because there's a lot of times today that I, I realize I'm making payments on a monthly basis that are based in my phone that I put in at one point that just never got rid of it. So I think what we're going to look at when you look at government-driven digital currencies, is it going to happen? I do believe it's going to happen. Will it take over the marketplace in a short amount of time? I don't believe so. Because we have to take care of the retail side of this before we look at the government side. I believe cash is definitely going to be eliminated in my lifetime. And I would love to think 
plastics will be as well. But we keep on finding new ways to make plastics more advanced in a digital way. So, you know, we're trying to meet people halfway. Jim, we already touched Metaverse at the beginning of the conversation. And uh, according to Infosys Research, more than half of American banks believe that investments in the Metaverse will be profitable within the next two years, while preferring to invest in such decentralized financial instruments as Web 3.0, blockchain, NFTs, and cryptocurrencies. However, each of these instruments has its drawbacks. Digital assets are susceptible to scams, cryptocurrencies are excessively volatile, the token market is highly unstable, and the overall sector is loosely regulated to be reliable, which fuels capitalism among at least one-sixth of surveyed bankers. So in your opinion, uh, who is right here, the optimists or the skeptics? And can Metaverse banking be a payback project in the short or medium term? You know, it's interesting. When you ask me about the Metaverse and investing Metaverse, my question usually back to you would be, what's the Metaverse? You know, what are we using as the definition of the Metaverse? You know, we, we talked about non-functional uh, art and all these other things. And, and you talk about crypto. We talk about AI. We talk about AR. We talk about a virtual branch, all these different things. We put everything into this bucket called the metaverse. In fact, ChatGPT is in the metaverse portfolio, if you want to call it that. So there's parts of it that I think we need to be aware of, but don't have to take action on. I, I think any financial institution executive or any financial institution that doesn't continually evaluate what's going on in what we'll call the general metaverse area, data, AI, AR, crypto, uh, NF NFC, every, every part of this and, and chat GPT. If there's not a continuous evaluation, we're putting ourselves at risk. On the other hand, I'm going to still say that nine tenths of financial institutions out there have priorities that are much greater than dealing with the metaverse. Now, that's not to say they should ignore it, but if you don't have your new account opening process, your new digital lending process, your customer experience process, your ways of building engagement today, you know, I, I didn't talk about this before, but we're no longer talking about the customer experience. What financial institutions have to aspire to is an engagement level beyond me looking at my, my mobile phone for my balances, but how are you going to keep a conversation going? Because that gets back to your risk factor. If you continually are interacting with me and continually give me information that makes my financial life better, then that's what you need to invest in. And what's interesting is part of the metaverse, and I'm going to say chat GPT is part of that, as is AI. If you do better at building content on the websites around how I can manage my money better, how I can move, I'm going to say the GPS of financial services going from point A to point B, most efficiently avoiding any hurdles and taking any shortcuts that are there, you need to build engagement that makes it so that I continually come back to your site for an experience and an interaction that's going to make me smarter. I want to be able to wake up every morning and you tell me as a financial institution what I should be investing in, what I should be taking money out of, where I may be overly too thick and maybe I have too much money in my checking out. Maybe my loan should be paid off. Maybe I should be taking more money out of my current mortgage because the interest rates are lower than market level and investing in different ways. I want you to be telling me that. Now, is that a metaverse relationship? No, but it's using tools of the metaverse to build better engagement. If I have a problem and I say, how do I pay down credit cards that are at X percent of my income the fastest, most efficient way. How do I get financially stable? You should have ways to tell me that on a very personalized basis. You know enough about me to say, based on your recent history over the last 10 years, here's what we believe you should do based on what's going on in the universe. Now, is that virtual banking? No, but it's using data and AI to build a better engagement level with me. So when you look at investing in the metaverse, I think number one, we got to pair that back and say, what are we talking about? Are we talking about crypto? Do I think traditional financial institutions right now need to be worried about if they offer crypto or not? You know, as soon as 18 months ago, every financial institution was trying to say, we want to offer crypto. It only took the crash 
for it to be taken off of everybody's priority list. I don't think we find anybody out there that has that as a high priority. A virtual branch, the same organization I mentioned earlier, the Coastal Community Bank, the small community bank in Everett, Washington, has a, a virtual branch that you can actually go in this virtual um, branch and do your banking. What they use it for is to find out what journey does a consumer want to take if given an open playing field. If they come into a branch, a virtual branch, and say, where do they go? What do they do? What do they want? Where do they, what doors do they open? And they can keep on testing things on an ongoing basis with their most digital consumer. Well, that puts them ahead of the curve. Now, do I think that most organizations, even in the mid-sized organizations, need to be in a virtual branch environment? Not at all, because they have bigger fish to fry there. So, number one, leadership has to be aware of what's going on in all those spaces. They have to have a plan in place. If any of them move, what do I do differently? I mean, I, I mentioned November 30th was when ChatGPT started. I think every financial institution should be continuously building new content for their customers that are going to use data internally, data externally to drive a better process. But most aren't. Most aren't providing the, the financial wellness tools that I need. But today, they're able to be built faster and better than ever before. So I don't think it's a priority for most institutions, except on the narrow way of using certain elements of the metaverse. And one of the key challenges for both virtual and metaverse banking is cybersecurity and the possibility of error-free user authentication that you already mentioned. While faking someone else's identity in the physical world uh, is not so easy, scams involving other people's data, access keys, and other security elements reach a qualitatively different level in the digital world. So do you think we can expect significant breakthroughs in this field? Or will the functionality of any electronic services be inevitably limited due to security concerns to prevent mass theft and fraud of using digital technologies? Yeah, I, again, I get back to David Birch's interview with me on Banking Transform podcast. I think it really gets down to authentication rather than privacy. If I can make it so that it's harder to authenticate me by anybody else, then a lot of the other de elements become a lot harder for anybody to access. If I also have the ability where my financial institution is continually changing my internal identity to the financial institution while not changing my identity, that puts things in, in a good perspective. I don't think technology has to increase risk, but it gets back to awareness and being aware of, you know, we're we, we not gonna be able to shut down uh, security and risk departments anytime in the future. Because what, where there's a will, there's a way. And the rewards in a digital world are a lot easier than when we had all these financial institutions separated by walls with bricks. Don't you have the feeling that soon the market for virtual services and finance might exceed the real one? For example, say you will sell your house in Brexville to buy a luxurious apartment in virtual Ohio if humanity starts spending a significant portion of life in the metaverse. Or that your virtual life will start to require more investment than your physical one. You know, we're, we're already seeing it. I, I, you're going to see a continuous shutting down of physical facilities. They're just not efficient. They're not needed. However, do I still want one? I do. Will I let go of that? No. But I don't need it a mile away. I don't need it two miles away. Now, there's some financial institutions um, in the United States would be Chase, it would be Capital One, it would be Bank of America that are right now building more branches. But their strategy is they're trying to build a physical relationship with consumers that were credit card customers that never had a physical access before. So Chase built four institutions within five miles where I am sitting right here today. We had Bank of America open up two new ones. That's because they were not in these markets, but there were still people that had credit cards and mortgages. With Bank of America, they had an investment account, they have mortgages. They have a lot of relationships that did not need physical facilities, but will be enhanced and more likely the consumer will expand that relationship if they know where that branch is located. Now, that goes across the board in investment services and everything else. You know, we used to have investment brokers sitting in offices, just like insurance brokers still do, everywhere. 
that's not needed anymore. But that does not take the human out of it. It takes the physical facility out of it. I think I still want to have a relationship with a human that may be much more efficient than ever because they don't have to go from branch to branch or, or visit people in a, in a real environment where everybody runs late. The expansiveness of the, of the, um, uh, of the appointment is, is so different. So, um, I, again, I don't think we're going to see a complete virtualization of the banking system. We're just going to continue to see the trend as we have in every other field, in groceries, in, in, in restaurants. I mean, I don't need a physical restaurant. If I have a virtual restaurant that has the best chefs in a back office kitchen that can be delivered by Uber Eats or by some other delivery service. Uh, Jim, according to Forrest, uh, companies striving for technological innovation grow three to four times faster than the industry average. How do they achieve this? Uh, do they truly increase labor productivity or is it enough to simply declare, for example, to investors that they are a leading technology company without actually implementing real groundbreaking projects? The consumer is defining what innovation and, and how forward-looking your institution is. We no longer can define innovation the way we used to, which is that next big thing, that thing that was going to grab on and be, because the reality is, buy now, pay later. I mean, that was an innovation, which really wasn't an innovation, because that's the same thing that was out there 30 years ago in a Christmas club scenario where you were able to, or, or a layaway program. And so what we have is new iterations of, of innovation. I think what we need to do, again, I'm going to get back to my visit to WeBank in China, is they are able to innovate a new product, new service, new delivery in less than 14 days, test it on the cloud, turn it on or turn it off, turn it up or turn it down, get out of it. We will only accept the fact that we were wrong and reset the, the cards, but we need to do it in a way that can be fast and scalable. Speed and scalability is where innovation needs to be, but it may not be that next big thing, but that thing that we used to do that's made better. I talk about the new account opening. I talk about other services which can be enhanced. I want a digital receipt every time I do a transaction at a bank. I don't get that. I, I don't get the reporting that I need or that I want to feed into another service that's out there. Innovation is why FinTech World did so well to begin with. Is they, they were hitting that niche that was very specialized. On the other hand, scale is still important. A new technology, a new innovation isn't good if nobody uses it. You know, it's not like if you build it, they will come. No, it's got to be usable. It's got to be something you can communicate to the, the marketplace as a whole that there's value provided. And unless you can do that, then it's wasted money. But I think where we used to have strategic plans where we said, we'd be doing this in the next 12 months, or we have major banks that say, we're it. We're updating our mobile banking platform. We're going to introduce a new platform in 18 months. What? What's 18 months? I want to know what you've improved over the last three days. Put that improvement in place. Make it so my, my relationship is continually getting better. Because if I have to wait 18 months for that turn on, I have some of that innovation that happened 18 months ago. It's already outdated, or at least behind the curve. I think people make their decisions for, with financial institutions. Again, the way I do with Amazon, it's a value proposition. How much value are you providing in the way I want to communicate, in the way I want to buy products, the way I want to use products, versus your cost, which we haven't talked about and probably won't, but there's no reason why we can't charge consumers for these innovations. Banking tends to give away everything and then try to collect it in a newfangled way that they've never figured out. The reality is people pay to go you know, five miles, five kilometers for a ATM that's not on their bank. They'll pay for some of these services. You just got to provide the value. Um, I would like to finish our conversation with recommendations. Whose expert opinions in the field of finance do you prefer to listen to? Whom would you recommend following and whose books would you suggest reading? Well, um, a lot of the people I want to mention have, have books already out there, so look up their names. I... There's, it's an expanding set of people. I'm extraordinarily blessed. That's why I'm still in this industry is I don't know everything, but I know a lot of people that do know a lot more. 
And to be connected makes it so my education level continues to improve. So certainly, I, I can't go without mentioning Brett King, Chris Skinner, Ron Shevlin, some new, newer players, Alex Johnson, Jason McCoola. Um, I'm going to leave people out, and it's gonna, I'm gonna be, people are going to be wondering what the heck I've done. But the reality is, follow my Twitter account, follow my LinkedIn, follow my podcast and my writings, and you're going to see who these people are. Every one of these people are very involved. But more importantly, I use Twitter as a research tool. I go to Twitter and say, new account openings, and Twitter will show me where it's come up in the conversation because they're going to come in the conversation before it comes out as a product. In addition, LinkedIn. You know, there's too many sources, but I think some podcasts out there. Each one of the people I mentioned have a podcast. They have writings they're doing. It's great to have those tools. You know, I, I'll be more than happy. If anybody wants to reach out to me at J Marus, M-A-R-O-U-S at thefinancialbrand.com. I will give you a documented list of people that I follow, why I follow them, the books they have. It really is deep, but the thing is, you need to continually embrace the change that these people are talking about. They have, each have their specialties. They each have an area that they do really well in. You know, I, I can't forget, you know, Effie and I, uh, uh, Paolo Cerrone from IBM. There's so many people, and I can't mention them all, but I think it doesn't take long to find those people through digital channels, which is kind of exciting. And then you can adjust as you go along. But uh, these, these people are people I've been involved with for a long time. They've helped me in my career, educate me. They continue to do that on an ongoing basis. But always look for the new source. You know, I, I didn't think when I had a conversation with Coastal Community Bank that they'd be the focus of many of my presentations, many of my discussions. But the leadership there is what really is going on there. You know, it, you have to keep, you know, you also have to keep aware of the, the leaders of the biggest banks and the biggest regulators in the world because they have foresight on what's going on or what won't go on in the marketplace. Jim, thank you very much for sharing your ideas and talking to Anderson. <laughs> Thank you so much for going in so much depth on all these subject matters. You know, I think it gets back to the fact that I mentioned it to you before we started this discussion, is that 80, 90 percent of this, to a good or bad degree, will still be very applicable a year and a half, two years from now, even though everything's changing. But we are still making the same mistakes we were making 30, 40 years ago when I started in banking. On the other hand, there's going to be new things that come into play that we haven't even imagined today, new ways of using technologies that haven't been in place. So, you know, again, we need to immerse ourselves in what's going on around us and be aware.